Archdeacon was, uh, went to Fairfield University. He came to the seminary one year after I arrived. We ended up graduating together because he took some summer work. He tested out of some of the Greek and Byzantine chant, and he ended up being our valedictorian of our class. So that's right. So we're very thankful for Archdeacon to be here. We look forward to hearing his talk. He's uh, married with three children, lives in Manhattan, so we thank him for coming out today, and uh, may God continue to bless your ministry, and we thank you again. There's, <clears throat> there's two things I would like to say. The first thing was the, the young man who was in my class that I began with was far more brighter than I was, so I had to do everything I can to get out of my class so that I could possibly become valedictorian in the other class. <laughs> and actually, his name after me was also Panderleimon. He became the uh, valedictorian the next year. The second thing I would like to say that in God's providence, and I truly believe that with my whole heart, the way I know about the whole Harvard situation that Father John mentioned was that somebody who stood on the committee at Harvard became very good friends with me. And so they were telling me the inside stories. But it was the summer right before I went to university studies that I met my now wife. So I think God works sometimes in mysterious ways, closes one door, opens another door. And I think had I gone Fairfield to Norwalk is a 12 minute drive, had I gone three and a half hours away, only God knows what would have happened. So I don't know why I said that, but I just want to say that sometimes God works in mysterious ways. As Jim Gabriel announced on Facebook, my topic tonight is Encountering the Risen Lord, Road to Emmaus. And basically, I just want to first begin by thanking Father John for inviting me this evening to speak to you all. And also, I want to also thank um, the community, because through Father John, it's these people who on a fr Wednesday night had plenty of other things to do to rest after a long day of fasting and then also participation in the long service. You know, I could totally understand if you want to be out of here rather than stay here. So I really appreciate on a personal level that you would take the time to remain and listen to someone like me. Um, why did I pick in Lent this pericope about the resurrection? Now, if any of you this evening could answer that, my job is through. <laughs> I could pack things up and go home. And I picked it because I'm always, uh, as a clergy and, and on a personal level, very intrigued, uh, just fascinating by this whole account uh, about Christ walking with the disciples to Emmaus. And for those of you who attend the Orthros, or who are able to attend the Orthros, it's in a sequence of what we call Eothina Evangelia, the Matins Resurrectional Gospel readings. There's not only a, a reading of the gospel in the liturgy, there's also one in the Matins, which occurs early on in the Matins. And in that sequence, there's uh, 11 Eosina resurrectional, and every week they go one, two, three, four, and when they get to 11, they begin at one again. In that sequence, four, five, and six, I think, are what I have, what you have on your handout uh, in front of you. And so Luke records in his gospel <clears throat> immediately following the death of Christ without anything inter without any interlude immediately will begin with what I've called part one part two and part three on your handout I also picked a theme of resurrection in the beginning of Lent because I think the church if we look at what we do in the church and how we do it I think the church has a tendency to begin at the end and start looking backwards what do I mean by that? It's after the resurrection that everything else starts making sense to the disciples. So I felt that if we could understand what it was all about to have Christ risen, and as we'll see in the pericopes, it's amazing how that comes out, we see why at the beginning of Lent, where do we begin? What's the first thing that we learn about the first Sunday? It's about the expulsion of Adam and Eve from heaven. Now, why would Lent begin with there? 
Because way at the end, what's the first thing that we see in the icon of the resurrection? Christ is holding two people, Adam and Eve. And what's the first reading that we begin reading in Great Lent? For those who attend the Vesper liturgy, the Vespers of Great Lent, it's the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 1. We begin at the, literally, Lent begins at the beginning. And there are three cycles of readings that occur in Great Lent. We have always a reading from the Old Testament, what we would call the, the law, which are the first five books of Moses, right? The Torah, as it's called in Hebrew. I don't know much Hebrew. And then you have a reading always from the prophets. Isaiah, normally, in this cycle of readings, we have readings from Isaiah. And then something from what is called the wisdom literature, which are the Psalms and the Proverbs. So the three elements that we begin, we're going to see what happens at the end. And I'll focus on that. Okay. So I think in the church's wisdom, it's no wonder why it begins in these things with these three elements. Because, again, like I said, everything will make sense when we look back. So let's begin by looking at the three pericopes. Okay. But on the first day of the week, that's what's in your handout. And I want to read it because I think it's necessary to hear it. This is part one now. The first day of the week, at early dawn, they, the woman, and keep in mind this isn't, the Gospels don't weave into the story after the death. They were all this and that. It's like death in Luke, and then immediately this is what we read. But on the first day of the week, at the early dawn, they, the women, <clears throat> went down to the tomb taking the spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? Remember how he told you that he is Christ, Jesus. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale. And the Greek is beautiful. I don't know how many of you understand Greek. And I'm not just saying that because I promote the Greek. Don't misunderstand me. But there's something to be said to read something in the original. And that applies to Hebrew. Like the Psalms, as you know, were probably hymns that were sung. So I've been told by our brother rabbis that when you read a Psalm in Hebrew, there is a, an internal melody to it. Almost, it's poetry. So there is an internal kind of flow. The same kind of thing. That's the word that we translate into idle. Liros tarimatafton. The words of them were liros, were idle tales. And I'll come back to that. Then, and they, the words seem to them idle tale, they did not believe them. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher. And stooping down, he beheld the linen cloths laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was to come to pass. Observations. There is no body. There's no appearance of Christ in this first account of the women. They just go to a tomb, look inside. There are two angels there, two men in bright clothing, angels, who tell them, what are you doing here looking for someone dead? He's alive. And you remember when he told you that? It's just an empty tomb. I find it very interesting as well that the women go, and then one of the apostles, the inner circle, goes. And I think, and I know I'm being recorded, but... I don't want this to be a statement of women versus men. Take this out of your heads. 
It's a matter of, for me, honor. And I say that because, and here I might be going out on a limb, Mary, Magdalene, Joanna, and the others, I can't imagine his mother not going to the tomb. I mean, if these other women were going, I don't want to speculate, but just as the Virgin received the first word that Christ would be incarnate in her womb by the grace of the Holy Spirit, I find it, in my mind, reasonable that the first to go to the tomb among the women was definitely his mother, I would imagine. This is dangerous exegetical behavior that I'm displaying, but I think I had read somewhere in one of the fathers that this very well could have been the case. In my mind, it makes sense. So no body, just an empty tomb, two angels. And as Father John knows, I always like to connect things to liturgical practices. Do you know where the morning gospel is read from? Does anyone know in the Orthros where the morning Eothino, resurrectional Matins gospel, is read from? It's on the side of the altar. And the altar we know from liturgical theology, sacramental theology, is the tomb of Christ. And at that moment, the good news of what? Of the resurrection of Christ is announced from where? Within the tomb. So the priest never reads the Eothino gospel, the resurrectional gospel, from the beautiful gate or from the pulpit. He always reads it from the side of the tomb and announces, and there's a rubric that says, in a loud voice, because it has to be clear and loud, this account of them. Perplexed. The, the women are perplexed. And I want to go back to the word that I had mentioned, liros, because the idle tale is very, idle talk is very, very weak to convey the Greek term liros. Liros gives birth to paraliros, which literally means someone who is severely sick, high fever, almost unconscious, and almost making no sense in the way they're speaking, similar to what you're experiencing now, listening to me. But the idea of a complete, I, I, I should have read more into it, but I would think it's like someone almost half drunk, like, uh, oh, uh, we saw this kind, this is liro, paraliros, this is this, they appear to the disciples, they're looking at them, we saw this, and, and they think they're in this strange, words are coming out of their mind because they are incredibly affected by the reality of an empty tomb. So they get, a, they get the first kind of glimpse into the resurrected Lord because the, no, they didn't see an appearance. They didn't have an encounter, which we're going to see further down, but they have an encounter with the reality of an empty tomb. And they have an encounter with the words that the angels say, he told you this is what he was going to do. So they have this in the back of their mind, and then they're in this state of thing. Very good. Because, and if you add to this empty tomb experience, the fact that three days earlier they would have seen him, possibly had the Last Supper with him, possibly had followed the events, as we know from the Gospel, of his taking up to the cross and being crucified and then being laid in the tomb. And just imagine the reality of them coming to the tomb where they had laid them in the stone rolled and having this experience. It's a tremendous experience for these people who just went through a tremendous up and down emotionally seeing their Savior crucified. Wow. And I think in, I think in many ways, although not exactly, exactly, not exactly, but the conversion of Paul. You remember he's on the way to Damascus and he hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he falls down, and who are you? And he's blinded. And then that experience in Paul, being perfect to the law, excuse me, perfect in every way in his belief in Judaism, creating him to become the greatest of the apostles, that encounter with the Lord changed him forever. We tend to think of the New Testament, right? 13 out of the 27 books are the hand of Paul. To just give you an idea of how someone's encounter with the risen Lord, at that time Christ was risen, right? The encounter with the risen Lord, the conversion that takes place, 
and then we'll see what Paul did, we know, we'll see what the disciples are going to do now in the next uh, sequence here. So then arose Peter, and he ran unto the sepulcher, and stooping down, right, wondering in himself, thavmazon to yegonos, what that which was to come. Because for Peter, he was bold. He had seen the Lord. He had seen the might of Christ in action. But he could not make sense of what was going on. The empty tomb, the linen cloths. In one of the accounts, we have a description of the linen cloths as being folded. Right, Father John? We have the linen cloths, you know, the body parts, but the headgear, the head covering, because they would cover the body and then cover the head separately, was folded and very nicely placed on the tomb, right? And there's a symbolism in that. Some fathers talk about, you know, people who worked in carpentry, which was a very, am I diverging for the sake of whatever? People who worked in carpentry would place a towel on top of an unfinished work, not folded, so that the person who ordered the table, the chair, whatever, as they would walk by, would see that the carpenter is continuing to work. When the work was complete, when everything was finished and set in its perfect form, he would fold the towel and lay it, and the person would say, ah, it's ready. So there is some symbolism, some interpreters say that the folded linen means that it was a job which was complete. Now the Lord is risen. And we're going to see this motif <clears throat> not only in the Gospel of Luke, but we're going to see it throughout the four evangelists of the Son of Man, delivered into the hands of sinful men, crucified, third day, resurrected. It's a motif that flows in all of the accounts. And what's interesting to me is the angels tell the women, you forgot. You forgot what he said. And they reminded him that the motif is, yeah, he was going to be delivered. He told you that. Yeah, he was going to be crucified. He told you that. He also said he was going to be resurrected. So let's go now to the second part of our reading this evening. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. That would equate to about a three-hour walk. How many of you have ever walked for three hours? Neil, great job. All right. I have never walked. I don't recall a time in my life where I've walked. Mr. Gabriel has traveled on a train for three hours, coming from New Jersey. But walking for three hours. Okay, so here they are. They're walking, right, from Emmaus, uh, from Jerusalem to Emmaus, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Now it says, that very day. So the, in the morning, the women had seen the empty tomb, told the apostles, and now that very day they're walking from, Emmaus to, from Jerusalem to Emmaus and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing to, together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation which you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered them, are you the only visitor, Jesus is perceived as a visitor, to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, what things? See, he's testing them. He knew, of course, what things. He's testing what things. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty indeed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us they were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. And they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said, to, who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, 
but him they did not see. Luke gives us a full description, detail of what happened. And why? Because who was the other person walking with Cleopas? Presumably it was Luke. For to have this kind of description in detail on the road to Emmaus, Luke must have been one of the two walking. So he's got the inside first-hand account. And Jesus said to them, and he said to them, O oh, foolish man, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses, the law, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the, same, the things concerning himself. Here is what happens with the angels and the women, but here, right, the angels tell them these things were going to happen. He told you that he was going to be crucified and all those things. But here is a huge difference. Here it's Christ himself telling them this and this and this and this. But what's more astonishing for me is that they have no clue who they're speaking with. They're completely blind to him. And on one level, can you blame them? A man coming back from the dead and walking with us for about three hours? For three hours. So they drew near to the village. I'm going to come back to these points. So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, Jesus, appeared to be going further. Prosepito porotero por And the Greek actually... Prosopito really literally means acting, like an actor. He acted like he was going to go further, you know? And, but they constrained him. Paraviasando is the Greek. It's not only constrain, almost a sense of violently constrained him. No, you're going to stay here, you know? Saying, stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. It's a dramatic scene, ladies and gentlemen. It's evening. They walked three and a half hours, three hours. They were weary. They were hungry. And they're sitting at a table now. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. I mean, it's like just like the Last Supper. And what happens? The second they see him take the bread and bless it, and he doesn't bless it. He, the, he takes the bread, it says, right? He was at the table, took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. It's a very, very dramatic scene. He sits at the table. He breaks the bread. They see in the act of the breaking of the bread, he re he, their eyes are open and they see him. Why were they not able to see him before? The recognition is in the breaking of the bread. For sure, I've, they would have seen the same similar repeated acts three days earlier. If they were in that upper room, they would have seen him give thanks, bless, and give it to the disciples. In that action, even though they had walked with him for three hours, even though they had talked to him for three hours, even though he had told them, don't you know you had to know all these things that were going to happen? It's not until he breaks the bread that he's recognized. And the question now is, where do we see the Lord? Where do we see the risen Lord? In our own liturgical practices, and the answer is probably pretty obvious, but we'll come back to that as well. They said to, to each other, and this is for me the most beautiful moment in this dramatic scene, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? He laid it out for them. And they rose that same hour, just had walked three hours. They rose at that same hour, and return to Jerusalem. Something, don't think of travel today, you get in your car, there's stoplights, highways, 
as police officers, to tread a seven-mile journey in the middle of the night to get back was a very, very dangerous thing. But of course, they could not contain their joy. They had seen the risen Lord. These two disciples, not the twelve, not the twelve, these two disciples of Christ. It's kind of interesting. Again, it's like he's teasing. I mean, don't misunderstand that word. In the most loving, humble way, he's, he's helping them build themselves up. He gives an empty tomb to the women. Now these two disciples are going to come racing back to the other and say, we saw him on the way to Emmaus. We've seen the risen Lord. He is risen. Okay? And let's continue now. I guess it's uh, verse 33. And they found the eleven gathered together and those who were with them who said, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Okay. As we said, some observations here. The important definitely difference from the pre previous is that Christ himself appears. You know? But what is incredibly important in this passage is that Christ gives absolutely no sign of being anything different than a full, normal human being on the road. They walked with him three hours. He didn't give them the slightest idea that he was not a human being. He didn't do anything miraculous. He, didn't, he was just a stranger. He was a visitor. Remember they said, are you the only visitor here in Jerusalem that doesn't hear what happened? Completely had faith, so to speak, by the Lord. Just a simple, full human being. No other such, you know, impression given. Now, they saw him how many times for three years? They knew him. If they saw him, they knew him. There was no question that they knew him. And his face, to put it that way, was many times close to theirs as it would have been as they walked. They would have seen the face close. And here, he doesn't reveal until the breaking of the bread. And it's interesting that in this case, Christ acts. He does the action and he's revealed. And I feel I had read something recently which I felt was so beautiful. I mean, all of us, every day of our lives encounter Christ, right? At least we should when we pray, whatever we do. But I feel like if you were to take this sheet and move it to your face like this, you can't see the words. It's like stuffed in your face, right? Think about it. I have a book up against my nose. I can't see the words that are on the page. Christ is so pressed upon our faces, so to speak, that we don't even see him half the time. And it doesn't have to be a spectacular thing, like he's going to you know, break bread and we're going to be revealed. But I suggest to you that there's much to be said about trying to see what's in front of us, trying to see the reality that the church gives us in, in every aspect of worship and in all the things that we do, trying to see exactly Christ staring us in the face wanting us to see him, in a sense, teasing us, so to speak. Not because he wants to elude us, but I do believe there has to be some work on our side in order to reap the benefits of encountering the risen Lord. It's not like he could have revealed himself to the women. He could have appeared to the twelve off the bat. He could have done a lot of things. But there is something here going on between Christ, the apostles. There's something. Not to speak of the dramatic disappearance of Christ. How he vanishes right in front of their eyes. At that point, they must have been just clobbered that this all happened so fast. So, yes, 
he is 100% human at that point, right? Because they didn't get any impression that he wasn't. But boy, this resurrected body of Christ is definitely gigantically different in what it does and how it does, right? So he just vanished. And though they're looking at him, they don't recognize him. But then they do recognize him. So there's something going on here. I don't know if this is as interesting to you as it is for me, but um, let's see. <clears throat> and today, like in movies, it, we can kind of imagine that because in movies all the time they do that, right? There's a guy there and then psh, he's gone. But for them back there, the, the impression would have been monument, I mean, towering impression of what just happened. It's like me disappearing right now, you know? And if it gets really bad in here, I might do that without you knowing. <laughs> so let's see how it closes, and then I'll make some final closing remarks, and then God help us all. As they were saying this, this is part three now. G now, let's read the, I kind of lost the track of the. They told, uh, then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. So that Cleopas and presumably Luke get back to the camp, so to speak, three hours later. And as they just finished saying that, as they were saying this, hey, we saw him, and he appeared to us, Jesus himself stood among them. But they were startled and frightened, and supposed that they saw a spirit. They thought they saw a spirit. How does someone now just reappear in the middle of them as they're gathered? Now Cleopas saw him disappear, now he's seeing him reappear. What's going on here? And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do questionings rise in your hearts? This is great now. See my hands. See my feet. Obviously, he was wearing sandals so they could see the, the holes of the nails on his feet. For a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I have the resurrected body of Christ, something different, yet something very much human, very much normal. Bones, flesh. They have a trendle, it says in the next uh, handle, it says, uh, see my hands and feet, that it is I, handle me, and see for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you. The Greek word is psilafizo, which is kind of like what doctors do when they check your tonsils. And they're trying to like see if there's something. Christ invites them, says, Kir, si la fisa temu, touch me. See me that I'm bone and flesh. I'm not a spirit. Don't be startled. It's me. <laughs> and what happens? And while they still disbelieved, so not as easy he's come, not only as he told them, put your hands in my hands, touch me, feel me, see that it's me, they're still a little like. I don't know who this is yet. For joy and wondered. They are overjoyed, yet still faltering. They are looking at a man they saw dead three days ago who just appeared in the midst. He is talking to them. He is telling them to touch him. Same body. They are completely complexed. Nothing makes sense. So in order to help their faith further, he asked them, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? Might as well eat something to show you that I can eat. So you don't think I'm still a spirit, right? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate before them. The way we ate before one another. The risen Lord who just appeared and disappeared is now eating right before their eyes. To show what? That the same body, the same person you saw three days ago, is now resurrected before you. Then he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms, must be fulfilled. The same formula used by the angels, the same at Emmaus, the fulfillment of the of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. He reveals everything to them. What was 
what came to be fulfilled in him. And he says, according to the scriptures, right? The same phrase, katatas grafas, where do we hear that? Anyone know? The creed, exactly. The church took this, that everything that Christ happened to Christ in his earthly life was exactly katatas grafas, according to exactly what the scriptures had said, with the law, the prophets, and the Psalms and the wisdom literature. The whole of the Old Testament spoke of Christ being crucified and risen. The church even kept it, as we just said, in the creed. Everything then was predicted. Incarnation, teaching, crucifixion, burial, death, resurrection. And this is the, this is the PowerPoint here. So he tells them, everything about me, the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scripture. Compare this to verse 31, where he says, and their eyes were opened. He breaks the bread, and then their eyes open. In this case, and they recognize them, and he vanishes, right? Here, Christ acts. He opened their minds to understand the scripture. In order to understand the scriptures, we need the action of Christ to open our minds. Let no one fool you, right? I can sit here, I can read a hundred books, right? And I can tell you all about Alexander the Great. And I can tell you all about, uh, name whoever. But to interpret and understand the scriptures is an act of Christ in our hearts and our minds. I say that because too often in today's world, everyone picks up a Bible and everyone starts talking about the Bible and this means this and this means that. We don't espouse this perspective because we have to encounter the risen Lord. It's not a scholarly work to look at the Bible. It's an act of Christ in our lives that opens the minds as he did to the apostles. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. See, he's telling them exactly, and he opened their minds to the scripture and said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be preached in his name to all the nations. Now you understand, my apostles, why it came to pass. Now you have the, perf the proper perspective in accordance with the scriptures, all this happened. All this unfolded in my life. This is why it all did. Now we get it, they're saying, Lord. Now we understand. But this cannot be contained within your own heads. Now you have to go into the world and preach this. But preach what? What is the, what is the message of the risen Lord to the world? Repentance and forgiveness of sins. That's what he tells us after his resurrection. Preach what? Preach repentance and forgiveness of sins. What is the essence of the gospel of the risen Lord? Forgiveness for everyone. Anyone who repents is forgiven. That's the way the Lord works. Healing, right? If you don't have like a total forgiveness, you don't have a total healing. It's no value. A real healing only comes from repentance and forgiveness, which creates a new beginning for someone who's completely lost. I don't know how many of you participate in the sacrament of confession, but I know that when I first went, we're humans too, it is a relief. It's a pulling back of all that weight that sits on the soul. You know, the more we open our souls, and we as clergy too confess. I go to confession. I know Father John goes to confession. All of that opening up all of that metania, right? So repentance means metania, means a changing of our attitude, a changing of the way we, our perspective, a changing of the way we perceive things to be. All of that is what our metania is. Once we do that, we begin to see our own weaknesses, our own wounds, our own frailties. Once we open ourselves to the Lord and confess that, he grants his forgiveness and everything is taken from us. That's why he came into the world. He didn't come here to not take all of the sins upon him. He came exactly for that reason, to take us 
though we were so worthless and so nothing, and made us little princes and princesses for his kingdom. That's where he elevated us, through his resurrection. Not for down here, for up there. And then he says, in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. What is the meaning here? The words of Christ in the gospel are never, ever just thrown like extra words, the way we write a turn paper. Christ says, you are witnesses of these things. Just two sentences. You cannot genuinely proclaim the gospel unless you are a witness of those things that Christ is talking about. What does that mean for people like you and me? Because after Christ died, right, and resurrected and then ascended, the early apostles saw him. What about the next generation who didn't see him? How did they know the risen Lord? How did they encounter the risen Lord? That is experience. See, we experience the risen Lord now, 2,000 years later. And to put the hammer, where do we experience the risen Lord? You better get this one right. Sunday, at every single liturgy, in the sacrament, the Holy Eucharist, we come face to face, would that we would see what's standing before us. We come face to face with the risen Lord. Face to face. It's in the breaking of the bread, is it not? Just like on Emmaus, they saw him there. And what do we do when we come face to face on Sundays with the risen Lord? We receive him. And then what's our command? He says to us, as soon as we receive him into us, you've been witnesses to these things. Now what do we have to do? We have to go out and preach what, ladies and gentlemen? Forgiveness and repentance. Where are we going? And as a saint of the church said, preach the gospel. What's the gospel? Christ crucified and resurrected. Repentance and forgiveness. And if you need to, use words. Because our lives as Christians, people here in this room, should reflect the Christ we carry inside of us. Eh? Should it not? If I say, hey, I go to church, I take communion, but I can't stand Maria. Is that really? Do we really have Christ, the risen Lord, living inside of us? No. I'm sorry. And if I offend anyone, so be it. We don't have Christ living inside of us. And then he ends in verse 49. And behold, I send the promise, and he promises to clothe them with the power on high, which is what he, uh, which is the Holy Spirit. Now the gospel doesn't end there. It has four more lines, which I, for some reason, only put in my text here in Greek, which is not in your text. Um, but then it says, he took them out into Bethany and lifted up his hands and blessed his disciples. Right? And as he was blessing them, the esti apafton. He was taken up, carried up into heaven and vanished from them. And they worshipped and they returned to Jerusalem with a haras megalis, with a great joy. And they were continuing, continuously in the temple, blessing and glorifying God. Amen. That's the end for Luke. And what a sight. And honestly, I bet that's exactly what's going on here. And I bet that's exactly what happens at every liturgy. The disciples are looking into the air. They see the Lord. He blesses them. And then right as they're seeing, it's like something's pulled in front of them, like a curtain. And they don't see him. And goodness, in liturgy, if we were which we should be, or maybe we were, but God knows it wouldn't be for our spiritual benefit because we might take it upon us. If he just pulled the curtain back for a second, when we say, Ten thousands of angels and ten thousands of archangels, myriads of angels serve at your holy altar. As a clergyman, we read these prayers, and we know we're surrounded by tens of thousands of angels who cannot gaze upon the mystery of the Eucharist. That's why they have six wings, two to cover their face, two to fly fast. And yet every Sunday we see the Lord in our face. And it's like, if we just could get a little glimpse in, and to see what's going on, you know? 
So the deeper we, ladies and gentlemen, move our faith and our love for Christ, because our Lord is so good, he's going to do that. He loves us. That's why he's going to do it. He wants us to. That's why some people say, you know, I went to this person. They told me everything about my life, and I went to that person. I don't care. I want to grab that Lord and press him to me. I want to keep him as close as I can to me. I want to, I want to touch the risen Lord in that sense that the apostles did. Is there anything more beautiful than that? I mean, think about it. So you see that, you see a great church with a dumb, who cares? I want to see the Lord risen. I want to be with him. I want to walk with him for three hours. That should be the, 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 the desire. That's why they say the liturgy after the liturgy. We receive Christ, what do we do? We go out. And the whole time we're out, we're thinking, when's the next liturgy so we can go back and see Christ again and again? And be with them and carry what we did inside of this house to the house of God, which is all the world, everywhere we go. And don't do what you can't do. Do what you can do in your work, in your lives, in your jobs, wherever you are. Wherever God's planted you, do what you can do. Don't do the impossible. Some people say, oh, Father, I can't read, I can't pray. Do something. There was one guy who said, Father, I can't pray. You know, it just not works for me. All right, so the priest said to him, well, you have any icons? He goes, yeah, I have icons. He goes, can you look at an icon for a minute? He goes, yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> he goes, go do that, he said. <laughs> so we start from what we can do. The Lord's not going to say, I, you know, lift 100 when I can only lift 10. You're going to do what you can do. And it's amazing, even in the simplest things. This might be getting into deeper waters. So maybe I should leave it to the side. So I just want to close... Um, only because he's recording me, I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I want to conclude because it was interesting when I was preparing these re remarks, I read something from St. John Chrysostom. And he said something interesting. He's, he analyzes these three pericopes as, you know, like a progression of faith. So, you know, like the Lord is, you know, testing the faith of the apostles. So he says... He shows the women, you know, we begin by hearing that the Lord is risen in our life. Yeah, the Lord is risen. We all grew up, oh yeah, Christos Anesti. What does that mean? You know? And the women go and see the empty tomb. So that's like phase one of our lives. And then we kind of walk all our lives with Christ pressed up against our faces, but pff, we never see him, you know? And then he opens our minds. Why does he open our minds? And this is important because we don't just sit there twiddling our thumbs all day. We have to prepare the landing pad for Christ to come down, so to speak, and enlighten our minds. We have to prepare the pad. We have to prepare the landing pad. Now, how do we prepare the landing pad? What are the things that we do to prepare the landing pad? Of course, participate in the sacraments, confession, holy communion, prayer life, fasting. You do what you can do, and that's helped to you by your spiritual father, right? Fasting. That's how we prepare the edapos, the ground for the Lord. And then he reveals himself. And there we touch him, we embrace him, we witness those things he spoke, and we go out and proclaim with zeal and fire in our hearts that Christ is risen. Truly he is risen. Truly he is risen. And it's no wonder that the saints were very easily, we're going to kill you if you don't denounce your Lord. Heck no. Take my arms, take my legs, take my eyes, take my ears. My Lord is risen. I have touched him. He has visited me. Nothing will separate me from my Lord. This is the depth of our Lord. This is what we are here. That's why we go to church. This is what makes our faith so remarkable, ladies and gentlemen, that our God became man, that he dwelt with us. He was 100% us, and he bore everything on his shoulders in order to bring us to a greater I think I should stop here. I don't know how long I've spoken, actually. I did not look at the time. Did I really? Wow. Sorry. <laughs>